Hi everyone. To start this presentation, we're going to go back to the beginning of the world. At the beginning of the world, but at a very specific world, the world of collections in C++. At the beginning of time, that world, there was nothing. There was nothing to work with the collections in C++. And then at some point in time, there was four. And this lasted for a long period of time. And that was before we realized that SCL algorithms were a thing. And then there, were, there was the era of SCL algorithms. And we were very happy with SCL algorithms until we moved into modern C++. And the following step after SCL algorithms in modern C++ in the standard C++20 is ranges. If we zoom in a little uh, on the transition between SCL algorithms and ranges, so um, let, let's take a very basic use case to do um, to for uh, data and collection. Let's apply a function on every element of the collection. Do that with um, SCL algorithms. We can use transform with this code. That's that's one of the basics of SCL algorithms. Another task we can do that's quite common is to apply a filter. To do that, we can use copy if that will transfer data from one collection to another one uh, based on a predicate. Now, what if we want to do both, as in um, applying a function only on the elements that satisfy, that satisfy the predicate? If that was, if, if it were to be an algorithm, that would be name has transform if as an output the if uh, transform to apply the function on it data but there's no such thing in the STL which means that to compose um, to compose algorithms um, it's it's not easy now to achieve that with ranges this is extremely easy Right. Um, this is um, like the, perhaps one of the most basic use cases of using C plus plus twenty ranges. We have data um, in the vector that goes through several pipes, several several um, uh, adapters. It's called adapters. One is filter, uh, and this adapter will only um, let the data from inputs that satisfy the predicate, that, that's the data that filter will let go through to transform that will apply a function and we can get the results into the, um, the results container. So that's a fantastic um, uh, progress from SCR algorithms to ranges to be able to write this kind of code, uh, which is simple, and to write it in a very simple way. We can uh, swap around the adapters, there's no, there's no imposed order for the adapters. We can start by transforming and then filtering, which might give different results based on the use case, but we can do that for them in any way, in any other form. It's an extremely powerful point. Now, um, if we focus on, on this piece of code, and if you try and, and um, see what's going on uh, when this code gets executed, for example, let's add a bit of logging um, just to monitor what's going on in this code. Um, um, just take a second to think what this code is going to point out. I would expect it to print all the numbers because since transform is at the beginning of the pipeline, it's going to receive everything from input. So I'm expecting to see one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we run this code, what we see is that we do see one, two, three, four, five, six, except there is a little more, uh, two times three and two times six, which is a bit surprising. 
And quite frankly, I don't think that we can guess what's going on just by looking at this code. It, it doesn't make sense. To understand what, what's going on for it to make sense, we have to um, dig a little deeper in the behavior of ranges on um, this particular use case. If we go, if we do it step by step, we have the inputs that that are adapted with transform, and the result is adapted with filter. Uh, when we create the, um, this uh, this adaptive range, uh, when filter is initialized, it's it's going to try and move um, over to the first value that satisfies this predicate. To know what value satisfies the predicate, it's going to ask transform to give it a value. Transform will ask in turn inputs to give a value and apply a function on it. In our example, the first the first example doesn't satisfy the predicate, so filter moves on. The second one doesn't satisfy the predicate. Moves on. The third the third one it does satisfy the predicate. So filter is ready to be used. Now we start the actual iteration, which is a, um, a succession of a, a dereferencing operator and the increment operator. So we start by dereferencing the first elements, and we, we ask filter the, the current element, and it asks transform in turn, which applies functional and whatever it provides to transform. And as you can see, we have two calls to f. This element. And then we start uh, incrementing over our filter until we find something that satisfies the predicate, which happens in the last element. And then we dereference it, and again, as a second call to the F, which is why we see one, two, three, three, four, five, six, six in the top. Now, um, Ranges are great, I think. Um, I do I do love that library. Now in this particular case, um, it's it has some it, it's a surprising behavior, especially if F um, is slow, for example, if F takes up a lot of resources to run, or if it has side effects, for example, it doesn't behave the way you might it to behave. It. I actually stumble on, on upon this because my program using ranges have surprising behavior and I did go back and out what was happening. Now um, uh, it's not to pick on ranges really, but ranges have a design, like most things, which means that uh, they have trade-offs, which means that they are very good at some things and perhaps not as good as other things. Um, this is a trade-off. Now, um, the, the, the design of ranges that um, causes the, this trade-off is that ranges are based on a pool model, which means that every um, component in this pipeline um, pulls data from the one before it. Pulls up pulls data from transform, transform pulls data from inputs. What if, what if we would design uh, the library differently? What if instead of using a pool model, we would use a push model? As in, inputs would provide, would actively provide data transform, which would apply a function on the data and, and pushes this result over filter, which would um, either not do anything or push it to the next one. The purpose of this talk is to explore this other possibility, which is not ranges. It's, it's part of it. And um, we'll see what advantages the push model brings and what drawback it brings, and how we can use ranges and this other model together to have a best of both worlds. If we um, um, try and represent this push model, um, I think that pipes, as in like the plumbing that surrounds you in your room, perhaps in your ceiling, or behind your walls, 
uh, actual plumbing where water flows through. Um, I think it's a good analogy because it, it's like input sends stuff like data or drops of water to transform, which does its stuff and then pushes data to the next pipe, the next pipe down the pipeline and so on. So far, it's just drawing, it's not code. We go to code later. Um, now, um, if we if we imagine this uh, push model with pipes, and we go back to our example of starting with the transform and then filter, then this would behave like that, and and we have to put something at the end because filter has to push data to something. Let's let's call this thing pushback, and let's say that pushback is tied to container like vector, for example, and it just calls pushback on the data it receives. It seems to, to add it to the container, uh, which is this time too. So let's see what's happening. We have one that goes to transform that has F applied on it. It goes to filter that doesn't come out because it doesn't satisfy the predicate. Same thing F2. And three comes in, comes out of transform, and that's this one satisfied the predicate. And it goes through pushback and ends up in the container. Four doesn't satisfy the predicate, now that does five. And six um, uh, does satisfy pretty good and has the function applied on it, and it ends up in side of the container. So this is the idea of this push pipes model. Now um, let's see some code. How how do we write that in code? Um, well, the purpose is to write code. That looks as much as possible like like uh, like, like, like the drawing. Right? So in code we have inputs that um, sense data as transform, sense data to filter that sense data to push back. Looks a bit like ranges really, but it's it's working with a push model as opposed to a pull model. Um, this is like a um, fundamental notion of this talk. So if if you have a doubt, if you're not hundred percent sure. To know what I mean between push and pull model, just let me know. Uh, you can unmute and uh, let me know that now. Uh, I will try and clarify. This is actual code, right? There's a library that connects that. This is C++. It's available um, in the pipes repository on GitHub. Now, if we do the same test and add some logging and, and check what actually gets to transform and what Function and transform gets supplied to. Uh, then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, which is what we expect. Now, as you can notice, this is not the pipe operator, even though this is called the pipe library, pipe library, it's not a pipe operator, which sounds a bit um, surprising. So, why this greater, greater, equal operator? Well, if you look at the pipes, and, and imagine data flowing in, uh, then the equal sign sort of like, looks like a pipe, right? So this is made to represent this uh, fluid coming through. Well, this is uh, actually, this is the reason that I found after the fact. The original reason is it's more technical, is because of the associativity of the operator. Let's zoom in on that. This um, greater, greater, equal operator is right associated, which means that when there's an expression worth, or there are several of them, uh, the compiler start by uh, considering the one on the right hand side, right, so this one. So this um, um, gets some results, let's call that pipeline one, for example, and pipeline one gets associated with transform, this gives uh, another result, which is called pipeline two, for example. And uh, the data inside of inputs get pushed into pipeline two. Now, if we uh, have an n value as inputs, uh, this will work okay. And if we have an r value, this was this will work just, just the same way. Now, if we um, have right associativity, that means that we have we can have either n value or r values as inputs. 
Now, if you consider the type of riser or area or riser, um, this one is left, left associated, which means that when we start with the expression compiler, start considering um, the expression on the left hand side, this produces a result. And since this result has to be associated with the other, the other components down the line, for example, Fulta, um, it has to um, so, somehow keep a reference to the data inside of inputs. If this is an L value, this is OK. This, this is easy to do. We can just keep reference. If it's an R value, then we have to keep reference to the um, temporary object that's represented by the R value. And this is not as simple. This is a bit complicated, actually. Now, ranges have this question because ranges uses the type of writer. So how do they manage to handle R values? The answer is um, they don't. Ranges just uh, don't comply with a very expressive static search saying you cannot get a view from a temporary control. So the, the, um, the greater greater equal operator, even though it doesn't have such a a great name, um, allows handling R values. So it's a trade off. Now we've, we've had some intuition for pipes. Um, the rest of the talk is to discover what pipes allow to do, as in what the push model um, allows to do specifically that we can't do with uh, any other model. We start with um, looking inside of pipes and um, uh, the property of pipes being able to branch out, which is unique. And then we'll see what we get into a pipeline and then what can come out of the pipeline. And then um, the interest of a pipeline to make things come out of it with some specific logic. The, the whole purpose of that is to have expressive pipes. Uh, every every point way. So uh, we've seen transform with some tools out, but um, there are more. Uh, there are five to do um, what you would expect um, to take um, just the first element to the same that way or to join to them and so far. Um, now let's zoom in into one part. Let's see what's inside of five. In code, what the code inside of the pipe looks like. Um, to do that, we're going to code up of the transform pipe. So um, this is uh, some. This is the code of the library where, where I took out the code of the transform pipe. This is transform.hpp. Normally, there's a code of transform pipe here. Uh, I've taken it out, and we have a unit test transform. That does uh, what we expect. So we have an input that gets piped into transform with with a function. The result is piped, is piped into a collection of results, and we expect the results to be uh, uh, twice the input of the function is uh, is multiplied by two. So we're going to code it to go transform. Well, if we look at the uh, Syntax used to transform, we pass it a function, anything that can be called uh, in its um, constructor. So let's let's do just that. So we have a class transform with a constructor that takes some sort of function. It can be any type, so we'll just use a template type. And um, it, it sounds um, natural to store the type inside of um, transform. So we're we going to store the function, this would be the interface, and in the data number, we'll have. Now, um, transform has to uh, be able to receive data and pass it on to another pipe, and it has to be integrated integrated with the whole library. 
we're going to go through the various features of the library. And there are quite a few. The first one is to be compatible with the greater quota, greater quota equal operator. And uh, there are plenty of other features. So um, we're just going to let the library know that transform is a pipe. To do that, we're going to inherit from pipe base. Um, if you want to have a look at pipe base, it's not too complicated. This is pipe base. It's more of a tag on base class. It's just a tag to let the library know that this is the pipe, so it should uh, be treated as a pipe. Right, now we need to make transform um, do its job of applying the function. And to do that, we have just one uh, interface or function to implement, uh, which is called onReceive. And it takes a value, say a value. So take the interface type. And there is, uh, we, we transform needs to know who to push um, its, uh, its value to. So it's going to push it to the rest of the pipeline. So we'll have a function do it and not get all the rest of the pipeline. Say so it's a pipeline, for example. Let's not worry about its style. It's just one. Okay. Right, now uh, transform wants to um, apply the function on value and send that to the rest of the pipeline. There's a function provided by the library, which is called send, which is a free function provided by the library. Um, it's the pipes namespace, it's pipes send. Where we're going to send a value to a the value we want to send is the application of function to the input value. We're going to send that to the table of um, Let's um, let's come to those. It's failed. Why is it failed? Actually, it's failed because just the library is compatible with C++ 40. And back then, in C++ 40, you had to specify the template types. It's a design choice to be compatible with C++ 40, but I think that it's a fairly reasonable trade-off between modern C++ and C++ that have in their production today. But that's okay, we'll just have the uh, classic trick of uh, returning uh, the uh, template object with the helper. So I need to transform the function, that is a function, and that returns a transform object. So this should have a different name as for that. And we return a transform. I'm going to run the test some with this, uh, this new implementation of the transfer pipe and the test uh, the pass. The message I want to pass with this pipe is that it's easy. This is what we expect to see. This is nearly the actual code for transport. There is a bit more, uh, but not too much like, like 
forward for what the is um, incompatible with the uh, state code. I can it's but this is the uh, So we've seen what's inside of the pipe and how easy it is to the pipe. Now, there's a, an interesting property of pipes is to be able to branch out. If we go back to the plumbing world, plumbing world, if you have a pipeline, you can you can easily imagine that you have something that goes into several directions. Right, so like a T pipe. And you can think of a T as in the T uh, program in Unix that forwards uh, the incoming data to the next program down the line, but that also dumps that data to a pipe. We can we can have the same thing with a pipeline in plumbing, and we can have the same thing with a pipeline in code, right? and we could. Log the, um, the intermediary results uh, inside the pipeline. So, this is just a drawing. If we look at code, this can look like this. So, we have inputs that pipes data into transform, that pipes data into T, and T has a new branch that's just a pushback in this case that um, sends data to this intermediary results container. And then the, the pipeline continues uh, afterwards. If we um, try and think about how this is going to happen, uh, all the data that comes out of transform gets into T, comes down into uh, pushback at the bottom, and also on the right to the filter, I will uh, either let it go through or not. So this is a slightly more complex pipeline. Um, and it's um, the nice thing about it is that it, the code looks like drawing, looks like it. T branches out in two directions, and for the purpose of, of lo logging. Now we can imagine to branch off into any number of directions. Fork, for example, fork into several directions, right? Um, and then each branch of the fork could have another pipeline tied to it, uh, which, could, which could have any anything in it. This, this is a more complex pipeline. And in code, it would look like that. We have transformed that pipe into fork, and the fork takes several arguments each of which is and if we send uh, some some data to transform to the beginning of the pipeline to transform it would go all the way and be duplicated duplicated yes, uh, into the three pipelines down the line another way to branch out is to unzip the top of the pair um, if we have a collection of pairs or tuples, we break them down into a collection of first, a collection of second, but further. The typical use case of that is to work with a map, which is a collection of pairs. It ends if we can uh, break down a map into a collection of keys and a collection of values with, with code that just said that. Explicit uh, equations. Uh, nothing more than to say, just break the top, break the pair off and shift the direction. So this this capacity of branching out into several directions, I think it's unique the push model. And I think unique in five. I haven't seen that uh, anywhere else. And this is useful to uh, represent fairly complex pipelines with fairly simple code, or at least code that doesn't, doesn't say much more than just declaration of the pipeline. Okay, now let's let's see what we can get into a pipeline. So far we've seen all 
all our examples with vectors. A vector is an S shaped container. Um, when a, when anything that has a beginning and end, such as a vector, um, is uh, associated to a void run, then, then the library iterates over that collection and sends uh, every element one by one to the point line. Now, it just needs a beginning and end, which means it doesn't have to be an S shaped container, it can be range, which means that we can use um, anything from the ranges library. And I think that this is how ranges and pipes can collaborate uh, to use the strengths of of uh, both of them to have uh, uh, it to be more uh, powerful and more expressive than just using uh, only one of them. Now, since uh, uh, the data that gets into a pipeline is pushed, it can be pushed from any source. One example is the output of an SDR algorithm. Because when you think about it, an SDR algorithm takes data and produces its results through an output iterator, which is some sort of like exit door where, where data gets pushed. If we could connect somehow um, the results of uh, the algorithm with a pipeline, we could, um, we could pick up the results from the algorithm directly into the pipeline to apply complex treatments on the results of the nested algorithm without allocating a, an intermediary collection to store the results and then work on them, which would incur some uh, post cost by just more code or noise code, and obviously a new collection that takes time to, to get built, to get allocated, and so on. Well, can that work? Um, well, it, it just works. To do that, we, we can um, put a pipeline in the position of an output iterator. Pipelines have the same interface as output iterators. They have some sort of like adaptation to output iterators. And you can uh, behave with an output iterator just like you would with a pipeline um, and send data to it. This is one of the uh, the things that you get for free when being, when inheriting from the pipe base uh, class. If you think back to uh, the last example of this chronicle, um, with this pipe base and library will um, allow your your pipe to be plugged into a server. Now this gets Perhaps more interesting if the algorithm has several outputs. In the in the yes, yeah, there are not many algorithms that have several outputs. There's just one actually that's partition properly. Um, but if you if if we think a bit a bit further than the SDL, uh, there's one algorithm that uh, I think is quite useful on nearly daily basis, perhaps not every day, but often. It's um, the possibility to, uh, when you have two collections, two sorts of collections, to separate somehow, to segregate um, the elements that are in the first one and not in the second one, and the one that are in the second one but not in the first one, and those that are in both. Sort of like a set difference from both sides and a set union, all at the same time, just one traversal. It, it's not. Tremendously difficult to carry up. It's not the topic of today, but let's imagine that we have such an algorithm uh, that's called set segregate. Or you can easily imagine that set segregate has three output iterators, and that we can um, plug each one of them into a pipeline. And the code just looks like before. As you can see, set aggregate takes two ranges as a foot and has three out three output um, parameters, which can be either output iterators or pipelines. So far, every pipeline has just one source of data. What if we wanted to, to work with several sources? sources of data at the same time. 
the most basic use case for that is to sieve them together, as in we have two um, two collections, like input one, input two, and we want to um, uh, traverse them in lockstep and taking the first elements of both and do something with those two elements, and then the second both collections, those two second elements, and so on. The, the not standard way to do zip is not standard in C++ Wisconsin, but the way to do it, the common way to do it that with ranges is to use the zip view copy. Zip um, puts together two collections into a collection of tuples, or rather a few of tuples. Right, so we have um, zip that will produce tuples, filter, uh, and filter reads those tuple and applies predicates to, to to decide whether or not to to make them available. Transform and transform applies a function on this on this um, tuple. Uh, in our example, uh, just multiply them together. That's why it's really This is um, a bit a bit um, so a lot of code um, to not say much, but this is a bit unfair because you can then say that it's auto and not showing. And we can use trust bindings um, to uh, not show the sort of get functions. Right, so this gets much more reward to use those to go to the trust bindings. So you the 14 auto right now. Now still we don't see the, the two separate arguments in the in the in the prototypes of the very good and the transfer. If we go back to pipes, uh, we can imagine a pipe where we provide data from two collections, and this pipe sends those those pieces of data independently. I'll show you in code um, in my notes. But just first with the drawing to build an intuition, uh, data comes in this pipe that's called MUX because it puts things together, and it goes through the pipe. In code, that would look like this. That would look like so Mark spikes data to filter and then filter to transform and then push out. The um, uh, important difference here with the previous code is that there is no tuple control. This is just regular functions. And this this comes from this is made possible by the push model. Because the push model just calls functions. It, it calls the next pipe. And when you call a function, don't you can pass as many arguments as you want. You don't have to pass just one tuple to pass argument seven, right? which means that there is no tuple showing up. You don't have to open up a tuple, and you can see the parameters inside of the, of the, of the prototypes. And we've transformed this particular case use two multiplies because this is a function that takes two parameters and and and, uh, and multiplies them together. How would we code that? Let's go back to the code. Uh, let's add a use case, max. In this test case, we have two collections, input one, input one, input two, and we max them together. And we would like transform to be able to code with several pieces of data coming its way at the same time. Then transform will do something with them and, and send the results to the data. If I try and compile this code, um, it fails because transform does not handle that the way we code it. Because transform receives only one value this time. To make it receive several values, well, we can just Make it receive several values. So I just add rules and dot of us. Let's try and let's try and build this code see if the pass is. And it passes. So it's 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 because we are sending we are we are receiving and sending previous pipes previous pipe which is months just sends data separately to 
to a um, transform. And then transform could apply just its regular function for that and just apply it to and, uh, and just to store on it. Let's see a, um, an example uh, just to get some impression of how to use pipes with read uh, use case. Uh, let's, let's use an example uh, based in biology. Um, this, is, this is just like any domain, so like it's fascinating. Um, I don't know anything about biology, so uh, you will be able to understand everything in this example. I mean, biology. So um, from what I understand, the chromosomes of a person, so let, let's, let's say that this is the chromosome of the chromosomes of someone called John. They go by pair, and, and John has, for every pair, one chromosome coming from his dad, and one chromosome coming from his mom. Now, um, we're going to create new chromosomes, the children. Of John. How does that happen? So, so John has two chromosomes every pair, and then um, there is some sort of like mixing of the two chromosomes together, which is called the crossing over. Uh, this is taken off Wikipedia. I've actually got easy stuff. Um, the two chromosomes uh, bend around each other, and and then they split. Which means that at each segment of the chromosome, let's say at each gene, for example, so that gene segment of the chromosome, um, I'm not sure if it's each gene or if it's tied or whatever, but let's, let's say it breaks up that gene. Um, at each genes, uh, for each gene, um, one of the two resulting chromosomes has either the version of John's dad or the version of John's mom. Right? And then this creates two new, unique chromosomes that are neither like John's or John's dad's or John's mom. This is a new person, right? Two new potential persons. And this is how John makes his DNA. Now, could we um, code that in C++ and generate new chromosomes? Let's say that we have um, two strings. For example, a chromosome is a string, and um, uh, a gene is a character, and it can be either a D for dad or N for mom. Uh, we have two collections. The first one is D, 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 D. The second one is N, 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 N. And we want to have two collections with either uh, some Ds and some Ms. And, uh, we want um, if one is D in one chromosome, the other one uh, the corresponding chromosome, the corresponding gene in DNA, just like before. Right? How would we code that? How would we code that with pipes? Well, first, there is clearly two collections that needs to be associated and need to be somehow upgraded. You can associate them with Mux. Then Mux sends um, every pair of genes, uh, one that on, to the next step. Next step, to do something. Sounds like a blind function, sounds, sounds like a job to transform. So the, the thing to do with those two chromosomes is either to invert them or to leave them the way they are. And this is random. So the function to do that uh, would, would either swap them or leave them alone. And then it would produce a tuple with those two genes, and unzip would break them off into two separate genes. The crossover function um, draws a number um, randomly. Two possibilities, and either swap the genes or just leave them the way they are. And if we assemble the pipeline and code it up, uh, it looks like this. 
have two strings about them on, and we mux them, transform them, we cross over, and unzip them, to push them back to the two children's from them. We run that program uh, on one run, it gave me that as, as randomness, so it doesn't get the same thing as the, uh, every run part of this, the other run. And uh, this looks like the drawing. And if we think if we think in terms of pipes, uh, then this goes uh, describes the problem, uh, it describes the domain problem, uh, with not too much code. Another way to work with several collections is to work with every possible combination between the elements of the collection. To do that, we can use um, uh, we can use the Cartesian product to mix all the all the possible elements of the collection together, send them to transform, and just for the purpose of displaying something on the slide, we, we send them to another pipe we haven't talked about, which is called Interspace, which uh, includes uh, something between every uh, series of elements of the series, uh, for example, a line break. And then it sends that to the final pipe, which is from Cal, and that's on Cal. But the interesting bit here uh, I want to focus on is that the product it um, combines all the possible elements, uh, all the possible combinations. And so, no, it works like mocks, it just sends data in the form of that. Another way to um, to associate several sources of data is to associate a collection with itself, like having all the possible combinations inside of the collection. And finally, um, you can associate a collection with itself by having by working on, on two successive elements in the collection. This way. Ranges do that as well, uh, but it's so much easier than uh, writing that. Like that. So this code would um, do one, two, one, two, three. Right. Now, moving on to the final part of this tool. How, how to pick up the data that comes out of the pipeline? What we can do at this, um, at this position, how we can take advantage of, take advantage of this positions at the end of the pipeline. Well, they, what we've seen so far is to push back the start into the container, which is the probably the easiest thing, the most simple thing to think of. Uh, we can also insert things into the container or override the existing content of the container, which would be the equivalent of the output of the trackers uh, that we can But um, we can also um, do a bit better uh, for example, if we if you consider the student data output trader, which is in the SDL, there's something a bit weird about it, is that it has to uh, you have to pass it two values. The first one is the output collections, the collection, which makes sense, and the second value is the position where we would like to insert this output collection. If it's a vector, for example, it makes sense, but if you want to insert into a set, for example, and specifying the, the position makes less sense. Um, it can be a hint at best, or it can be um, uh, something misleading for the platform at worst. And in most cases, you just don't want to, to say anything. You just like to insert stuff into the set and let the set do its job of having a sorted, uh, sorted data inside. So this is not really useful. So um, we just use inserts to insert. Yeah. Now, if um, for some reason there is one branch of the pipe that we want to ignore, one branch of a pipeline or, or the algorithm, the any branch that we'd like to ignore, we can just cut it off uh, with the devnal pipe, which is a very simple. And the pipe that's uh, like they're not immunized, it's just uh, the data you see. So, awesome. 
but if you don't care about that data, uh, that's okay. And this allows you to implement uh, some, some algorithms in a very uh, impressive way. Or you can do um, anything, really. For example, uh, you, can, you can call your function. Uh, like the end of the pipe will, will be your function. This is particularly useful um, to work with legacy code. Because in, in legacy code, sometimes you have some homemade collections that don't have the uh, same interface as the SEO, they don't have a pushback. You have some weird stuff um, to insert stuff into these collections. So you can just plug the legacy function at the end of the pipeline so that it, uh, you can at least use pipes modern C++, even though some part of it is still late. Now, something that's um, also specific to the push model pipelines, pipes, is that you, you can write code at the end. Right? There is an end. A a every piece of data is going to somehow come out to an end. Doesn't doesn't go into port. Um, so you can write code at this end and and pick up the data and do something. With it. Let's see an interesting example. Let's say that we have um, a map uh, or something that looks like a map, for example, a vector there, which is a bit similar to the structure of a map. And we have a second one, right? And um, they have some keys in common. And they also have some keys that are specific to the collection. In this example, two and three are in common between the two collections. And let's say that we would like to add the data of new entries into uh, the data of a uh, map, of the first map. Then it would be nice if we could aggregate the values on the similar keys. Because with the STL, you have two choices. Either if, if you have the same key, either you keep the, the existing one or you replace it with the new one. But quite often we would like to to have a bit of both, like to aggregate the new one with the existing one. This is what map aggregator, which is an end pipe, does. Because of its position, it, it's at the right right location to, to do this draw. Uh, so if you have this function concatenate string, which is uh, essentially the plus operator, you can just uh, just concatenate values uh, in those maps. So at the beginning, my map, uh, sorry, at the end, my map contains uh, this with the, with the keys two and three with aggregated values. Now we've seen a lot of advantages uh, of pipes and um, of the push model, but this uh, wouldn't be a fair analysis if we didn't have a look at the limitations. Because pipes have a design, which means that they have, a they have some trade offs, and there are things that they do well, things that they don't do so well. So, what are those limitations? Some of them, at least those that I've encountered so far, and uh, I guess there are more, uh, include that pipes don't know what's coming next. Right. Like if, you, if you think about how we implemented uh, transform, uh, we have this on receive function that receives one value at a time, and that doesn't know if this is the last one. Right. As opposed to ranges that have a begin and an end, right? So you know when this is the end. Pipes don't know that, which makes it difficult to implement some. Functionalities such as reverse, for example, because you don't know if it's finished and if you should start if you should start reversing. I don't at least I don't know how to implement reverse with pipes. I won't have any idea to do that, but I think it's a limitation. Same thing with draw plus, you just don't know what it's the last. And um, they don't store data. Because um, they can accept any kind of data. Remember, uh, our, our on receive function 
had a template parameter which is the value, and and this value by can change every time the pump is called, which makes it makes it very powerful. But at the same time, means that we can't store that data because we don't know the type value and we don't know what type we should uh, we should put into the data manga or transform people where it's going. So we, we don't cache anything. Um, as opposed to ranges that know the type, the type of uh, what's in there, right? Uh, all the elements of a range I think are always of the same type, and you know that type. Um, so there are some things that I don't know to include, such as split, for example, as I'm splitting uh, strings. But another limitation is that we can't just send something to a pipe, it has to be a pipeline with an end. Yeah, like I say, uh, the data on the pipeline doesn't end in two volumes, but it has to end up somewhere. So when we build the pipeline, we have to, when we, sorry, when we send data from source to pipe, it has to be a, a fully built pipeline already. We can build the pipeline step by step and pass it, pass it on to functions or return it from functions. But at the end, when we send data to it, it has to and as you noticed in code examples, um, we have to create the, the resulting container beforehand, before, um, before sending data to the pipeline on separate statements. Because if we have, for example, pushback, it has to be tied to some container. And if we create it on the spot as a temporary, then it can't be afterwards. Now, um, the trade-off of the library um, allows to have some strengths, like we have seen. Uh, we go back to the, 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 the first example. We went through the transform filter and had one, two, three, three, four, five, six, six. Remember, um, we don't have this problem with pipes, and we can accept our values because of the um, greater greater equal point out. And there's this specific feature of branching out to several direction. We can pick up data coming out of anything like the algorithm, for example. We can have multiple values without tools, like example, using products. And we have um, we have a um, some sort of entry point uh, at the end of the pipeline. At the integration with result, resulting containers, so we can write some code there. For example, with app, map aggregator. And finally, um, as you have seen from the demo, uh, live coding they are very easy to implement. So if you want to add new pipe, um, it should be done. If you do want to add a new pipe, all contributions are welcome. So request. Now I have a question for you in terms of the uh, contributions design of the library. I have two questions actually. First one is in the examples that we've seen, um, uh, we had, uh, for example, pushback of something, insert of. What would you think uh, about allowing? Do not say anything and do the obvious thing. As in, if R is a vector, or if R has a pushback method, uh, then just do like uh, just do as if it was pushback with R. Um, the first expression would uh, still be allowed, but the question is, should we allow the second expression just apply to R because it's shorter but less explicit? What do we think? And second question. What's it name for this one? Because greater, greater, equal, equal is is not the most catchy name. Uh, uh, so I guess we can have a better name. It's not like that. That's it for me. Um, if um, if you have any um, opinion about the previous two questions, I'd be glad to read them in the Slack channel. And if you have any questions, well, now. 
about the talk or about the points, but uh, I'd be also very happy to have them now in Slack channel. Thank you.